Fantastic. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, my name is uh, Simon Delisignon, and um, thank you very much for joining this uh, part of our uh, lunchtime seminar. And this one's about the importance of virology um, at a time when uh, our virological illnesses are having to go through a bit of a reset. So welcome to the uh, webinar. And um, uh, I'm, we're going to move on a slide, as just, just happened by magic, um, to discuss the brief program. So I'm going to make a very brief introduction about the uh, primary care uh, surveillance system and its important role in biology. My uh, colleague, um, Yannicka um, van Summerton, is going to then talk about a very important study we're doing in respiratory syncytial virus, a virus that up to this year always came at the same time. And then we're going to hear from um, two of the members of our practice liaison team, uh, Lizzie Button and Alice Williams, about um, hints and tips for practices involved in virology and also about how we should directly engage with patients and a roundup uh, on the key messages and any questions. So thanks again for joining and we will move on a slide. Um, for those who might have joined a, a, a moment later, I'm uh, Sam Delisignon from, I'm a GP and Professor of Primary Care and Clinical Informatics at University of Oxford and also lead the um, Royal College of GPs uh, Sentinel um, network system. We label the overall hub that sits in ORCID, which stands for the Oxford Royal College of GPs uh, Clinical Informatics Hub, and this hub has a number of platforms within it. And the one we're talking about today is the surveillance platform, which um, is one of Europe's oldest central systems, the Oxford Royal College of GPs Research and Surveillance Centre. I'll have my next slide, please. Um, the network's been going since 1967. And for those of you coming to next year's RCGP conference, it should be our 55th birthday party, as well as the 70th uh, birthday party um, for the college. And we have practices, in fact, distributed through England and Wales, but our sentinel surveillance is all in England. And we're extremely grateful and appreciative of practices that share data with the network. And we say we share data for um, surveillance, quality improvement, research and education, and we use the acronym SQUIRE for this. As you can see from the slide, we've got a nationally representative um, group of practices, and our most important practices within the network are those who take either virology swab samples or who um, uh, take serology. Now, I just want people perhaps to give a moment's thought about prior to last year, what was the infection that we always saw in the same weeks of the year? So at the end of the year in primary care, roughly between about week 42-ish and week 52, we always saw one infection circulate, which with the social isolation and uh, sorry, social distancing, and perhaps there was some social isolation that happened in in uh, in um, uh, the COVID pandemic, we just didn't see circulating last year, as indeed we didn't see um, any uh, influenza. Anyway, for those of you who have either uh, um, written it in the chat or wherever. That the germ I'm talking about, or the bug I'm talking about, is RSV. And if we can move on to the next slide, what I have got are two slides. The one on the left, which I, uh, with, uh, the left, is from uh, 1999, and the one on the right is from 2016. And if you can see on these, 
between weeks about 42 and 52, there is one high peak of data, and that is acute bronchitis and bronchiolitis in children under five. And many of us are familiar with the, um, you know, the, the, the disaster and the stress if um, we have a mother who's not immune to um, RSV and their baby in the first six months of life gets uh, bronchiolitis in those particular weeks of the year. The next biggest peak after that is uh, acute bronchitis in the over 65s, which more follows um, RSV. I'm sure these things are things people on the call are familiar with, but I think it's quite amazing how similar those two graphs are. You know, it almost looks like it could be a fiddle the way the spacing and things are done, but I promise you uh, it, it, it is not. Um, we've actually got a, a, a grant from, from the Wellcome Trust to actually look at these 55 years data, which are quite unique. I'm going to whiz on to one more um, slide. And this, again, you've got eight years here. And the solid line in both sets of graphs is acute bronchitis in the under fives. And the upright um, sort of bar chart is RSV positive swabs collected from this surveillance system and sort of shows the value of the work. And you can see that the peak of RSV pretty much coincides with the, um, uh, with the circulation of, um, of RSV. And we're really appreciative of the extra efforts that our practices make to go through the extra effort of either taking a, a sample from a young child in a consultation or providing a kit either directly for a family to self-sample or to order online. If I can nip on to my final two slides. Uh, this is just showing the five-year average of influenza-like illness. The blue line is the five-year average. And you can see that last winter, there was relatively little influenza-like illness. And the only virology bar at that time was, was COVID. And how as people are mixing more through the autumn, we're seeing a range of sporadic circulating viruses. This is taken from our weekly report, which uh, practice data has contributed to again for the last 54 and a half years. I'll move on to my final slide. And this is really showing um, a pattern of virology that is completely unique. Along the bottom, as in all these slides, you've got the week of the year. So you can see we're moving towards week 51, the end of the year. And the pink is uh, a COVID uh, positive swab, and the gray is RSV circulating long before week 42, which is when it would usually kick off a more sporadic influenza than we've seen at the um, other time in the year. So uh, my purpose has just been to introduce the network and also to flag up how important the work in terms of recording data is. And this data uh, feeds importantly, as it has done for over half a century, into our national surveillance system. I'm going to pass over to Yannicke, um, who I think is going to now talk uh, next. Uh, thank you, uh, Simon, for the opportunity to present uh, this work uh, on this meeting. My name is Janneke van Summeren and I'm an epidemiolo epidemiologist working at the National Institute of Health Service Research in the Netherlands. And that's located in, the, uh, in Utrecht. Uh, I'm going to present our RSV ComNet study. And RSV ComNet stands for uh, RSV uh, Community Network. And in this study we are measuring the disease burden of RSV in young children in primary care. The study is funded by Sanofi Pasteur and AstraZeneca. However, we are in charge of this project and data sets are not uh, shared with uh, the funding agency and all public health implications and conclusions are determined by NIVEL and the country partners. Next slide, please. So a background uh, of RSV. 
A global burden of disease study in 2015 estimated that approximately 33 million children with, uh, were affected with RSV worldwide. And 3.2 million children were hospitalized and almost 60,000 children uh, died in the hospital. However, uh, death due to uh, RSV infections in uh, Western countries is rare, but uh, still a lot of children are uh, hospitalized because of an RSV infection. And therefore new candidate vaccines and monoclonal antibodies are a late stage clinical trials. And although there's uh, quite a lot of knowledge about the disease burden of RSV in a hospital setting, there's a lack of knowledge on the disease burden of RSV infections in primary care. Uh, and this, uh, while the majority of children with RSV are managed in primary care. And this information is needed to support future uh, prevention strategies for RSV. Next slide, please. Uh, at this slide, you can see the burden of disease pyramid uh, from the US in children uh, under the age of two years. And you can see that 97% of all healthcare utilization is in the outpatient setting. And therefore the majority is in the pediatric uh, practices, which is similar uh, to the general practices in the uh, UK. And uh, only 3% of all children that seek medical care for an RSV infection uh, were hospitalized. And uh, the number of deaths are a fraction of that. Next slide, please. So the aim of our RSV COMNET study is to measure the clinical burden and healthcare use of RSV infections in young children seen in primary care, and to measure the complications associated with RSV infections, and to measure the socioeconomic impact uh, of RSV infections, and this in terms of costs. Next slide, please. Uh, what we, uh, we have done so far is that in the winter of 2019 to 20, we have developed and evaluated a standardized protocol to measure the disease burden of RSV in uh, children aged under the age of five in primary care. And we have evaluated this protocol in Italy and the Netherlands. And after we have done some uh, adaptations and the new final protocol is uh, published in July of this year in BMC infectious diseases. And this uh, final protocol was uh, in the previous winter uh, already implemented uh, in the UK and the Netherlands. However, uh, just as Simon uh, just said, there was hardly any RSV activity in the, win in the previous winter. And therefore the study uh, was extended over the summer period and continued uh, with data collection uh, in the upcoming winter. Uh, and in addition, we have uh, increased uh, the number of countries that are participated and also Italy, Spain and Belgium uh, are uh, going to collect data uh, this winter, as you can see in the figure. Next slide, please. So the methods, uh, our study is a prospective cohort study and uh, we ask the GPs or the pediatricians in, um, for example, uh, Spain or Italy, because they are the primary care physicians in those countries, to swap children aged zero to four years that uh, visit the GP with symptoms uh, of an acute respiratory infection of influenza-like illness, and uh, the swaps from the children that tested of the children that tested positive on RSV were eligible for the follow-up questionnaires, and these are questionnaires for the parents to complete 14 days at 30 days post swap. And uh, the parents of the uh, questionnaires are about the clinical burden. And this is measured in terms of uh, the type of symptoms, uh, the duration of the symptoms, complications, etc. cetera. Uh, the healthcare use, for example, consulta consultations to the GP, the number of uh, consultations to an emergency department, to a pediatrician in the hospital, the number of patients that are hospitalized, the uh, uh, length of stay of a hospitalization, and the medication use. And we have uh, measured the socioeconomic impact. And this is in terms of work absenteeism of parents, productivity losses of parents, uh, the number of missed school days or daycare uh, facility days of children, and the quality of life. Uh, 
Next slide, please. So uh, we hope with this study to increase the knowledge about the disease burden of RSV infections in young children in primary care. And this is important because these results are needed uh, for uh, models to estimate the potential cost effectiveness of new prevention and control measures for RSV. And uh, with this study, we can compare the disease burden uh, across different uh, European uh, countries. And on the longer term, we aim to establish an RSV burden of disease pyramid similar to the pyramid previously shown from the, U uh, from the US. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm the research coordinator on this RSV Comnet project. And together with uh, John Petchett, uh, that's the PI of the RSV Comnet study. We are the coordination team of the European study. And uh, we are working together with researchers from all the countries and also from the uh, University of Oxford. And together with GPs and pediatricians working in the field to collect the data and to increase the knowledge about uh, the disease burden of RSV in primary care. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yuyanka. Yuyanka, sorry, I keep getting your name wrong. Um, and uh, I don't know whether anyone's got any questions, but if you have, please put them in the chat and we will uh, get back to you uh, with any questions that um, you might raise or if they can be answered in the chat, we'll do so. But thank you very much uh, to you and John for all your work that you're doing. I'm now going to hand over to uh, Lizzie, who is working very closely with you um, in terms of getting this um, going with uh, practices. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, uh, Janneke. That, um, it's, I think it's really interesting to see the global um, impact um, of RSV and just to sort of reiterate what I find really interesting about the study is that it's really addressing a sort of unmet need in, in terms of research by looking at the RSV burden, um, not only in primary care, but also looking at the way that it impacts families, uh, everyday families as well. Um, just to say that this study recently um, has been extended until the end of July. So um, we'll be continuing with study and with data collection um, throughout the winter period and into the summer as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, I thought it would be uh, useful just to kind of break down um, the main steps of this study. Um, and just to say that if you're already participating in virology surveillance, that uh, more than half the work is already done. So the study begins with a uh, young child under five who is presenting at the practice um, as Yannicka has covered with symptoms of influenza-like illness, uh, upper respir um, acute respiratory infection and fever. Um, that child is then eligible for a swab. And if that um, swab goes on to be RSV positive, then um, practices um, are asked to follow up with the parents or guardians of that child for um, two short telephone questionnaires um, at day 14 and day 13 for swab. Next slide, please. So really the main thrust um, for practices is to be on the lookout for any symptomatic uh, under five-year-olds. Um, and this is useful anyway in, in two main ways. The first is that it really helps to support our virology surveillance program. Um, for the virology um, collection that we do, we ask the practices um, swab all age bands, but we do find that we need more swabs in the uh, clinically vulnerable, so those who are over 65, but also especially in young kids uh, under five years old, so this study really helps to support that. Um, the second reason, and I think this is perhaps helpful to reiterate to when speaking to patients, um, is that it's not just about COVID. Um, obviously, COVID is, is extremely important at the moment. Uh, especially with, with new variants and things. But, um, you know, it's also really important for us to keep tabs on other viruses that are circulating. And that's one of the main benefits of the swabbing that we do is that it gets tested for, for multiple viruses. And that's obviously good for patients to know, but um, can also be useful for practices in terms of uh, things like antibiotics. 
Um, during the pandemic, we set up a, a self-sorting service. So we do try to encourage practices to, um, to utilize that service. Um, also because it sort of helps to reduce the burden on practice staff. And I've just included a, a little paper here that, um, that I stumbled across a couple of days ago, um, basically demonstrating that the swabs that are taken at home by parents, um, that uh, parents are, are doing the swabs correctly enough and they're able to pick up viruses just as effectively as uh, practice staff. So that is reassuring, if anything. Um, we uh, also adapted the, the, the study slightly to allow for verbal consent in the first instance, again, to sort of reduce the time burden. And we have a short script available that we can provide to practices, which you know, covers the essentials in terms of um, participation being um, voluntary um, and that it will require some access to the child's medical record. Um, I think Simon has already covered one of our key mantras, which is uh, coding is caring, that is coding into the patient's medical record. Uh, and for this study, there are two, two bits of information we ask um, gets coded. One is the uh, CPMS ID, that's the central portfolio management system, it's a consent variable. And the other one crucially is, is the result. Um, and I think the, you know, not only does the coding increase the amount of data that we can extract, but it really pushes up um, the research quality in terms of what the analysis that is ultimately done um, for this study and for our virology surveillance in general. <clears throat> Two other bits of information that are really helpful for the practice to keep on top of is the swap date, as well as the lab reference number. That is a unique number that's attached to patients Medical um, test result. Um, and yeah, so those four key bits of information would be helpful for the practice in terms of following up with a uh, patient, but also for running reports when it comes to monitoring. And then just a final note on the questionnaires. Um, these, um, they don't necessarily have to be done by a GP, they can be done by an HCA or a nurse, so long as they're comfortable with taking consent. And, um, and, uh, and asking the questions. And although day 14 and day 30 are, are ideal time windows for doing the follow-up questionnaires, uh, we have allowed um, up to 60 days for those questionnaires to be done um, in instances where perhaps the parents are busy or the practice um, you know, is, is a bit stretch of the time. Um, yeah, and that, that's it, I think. Um, Across the network so far, we've um, collected around six, 60 telephone interviews. Um, and yeah, if, if, if any practices are looking to join, then do please get in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lizzie. And um, I'm now going to hand over to Alice, who is uh, going to talk about how you can use patient participation groups to um, recruit into. Um, the studies. Uh, thanks very much. Um, thanks for the slot. I'll be brief. We've only got a few minutes left, but um, could I have the next slide? Oh, there we go. Great. Uh, so we recently uh, were awarded a small grant to have a look at how we can best uh, engage patients through patient participation groups and increase the number of swabs that uh, patients can take, or just spread the word that taking these swabs are an option for patients who have flu-like symptoms, and they don't just have to get the test and trace swabs, because so, these swabs, um, as Lizzie said, have uh, are tested for all sorts of other viruses apart from COVID, so they're really important for us and patients to know about. Next slide, please. And so uh, just to recap some of the stuff that Simon mentioned, so. Uh, our network extends across uh, the country and have lots of practice engaged. And most of these practices should also have patient groups or patient participation groups. And what I'm trying to do at the moment is reach out to as many of these practices as I can to see um, if they have active patient groups and if I can speak to those patient groups to see what sort of information they want to know about, the different channels um, that communication happens through how we can sort of tap into these levels of communication to spread the word about swabs, in particular about the uh, take a test swabs that Lizzie mentioned, where patients can take these swabs at home and send them off in the post and get results back. 
Uh, next slide. So we're at the first stage at the moment. So at the moment, I'm talking to different PPTs and practices to see what they do for communication and suggesting other ideas or developing ideas with uh, patient groups for what we can do to increase swabbing at their practices. And some ideas include drop-in sessions or webinars or um, different patient-friendly web pages, but it's meant to be quite an open-ended um, project. So whatever would work for a particular practice, we're gonna try and work it out. And then hopefully over the next few months, we'll see which, which interventions work and which don't at the five uh, initial practices that we'll be trying this out in. Then hopefully we'll get some information about what works and spread it out to other practices across the network. So what we're doing is we hope to improve patient knowledge and understanding of surveillance and research and increase the number of swabs that um, patients are taking and um, also learn some things about how we can better communicate what we're doing to patients um, to better inform them on the research and surveillance that we're doing. So the next slide. So um, this is just a general shout out for any patients or practices who are listening in. Um, if you're interested in uh, talking to me further about this, do please get in contact. And thank you already for everybody who has gotten in contact. All the talks and discussions I've had so far have been really, really informative. So do keep do keep emailing me. That's all great. And um, all the things we learn, I'll try and uh, distribute out to practices um, because it might help patient communication and engagement to practices as well. So hopefully it should be a generally learning and uh, experience over the over winter. Thank you very much. Thank you um, very much, all of the contributors. That's really helped um, us sort of spread the word about RSV and uh, and what we're doing in the RSC. Um, in order to um, recruit patients into the study. Simon, did you want to add anything further before we uh, finish? I'll just pass on thanks to everyone who is willing to um, share data with us. We greatly appreciate that. And uh, super, super accolade to anyone who fits into busy primary care. Also, the, the, the steps to help um, virology and serology sampling um, high data quality and sampling is what really differentiates and makes our network and any little efforts people make in that direction are just enormously appreciated, but also make a fantastic um, contribution to uh, national surveillance and understanding of um, infectious disease. And obviously we're delighted all to have the opportunity of collaborating with uh, illustrious colleagues like these from Nivelle, who I think the, um, the RSC through my predecessor has a couple of decades of history of collaboration with Nivelle that we're uh, delighted to be um, involved with. So thank you very much all of you who've given up a slot in your um, uh, lunchtime, if uh, well, the imaginary lunchtime of primary care. And um, if there are any comments, either by email or, or now, we're delighted to receive them. Thank you, Simon. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. We will stop uh, the webinar. This will be available later on the uh, link uh, that we will circulate on our website and in newsletters that follow. All, all your questions will be answered in the chat, if not in the chat directly now, but we'll follow up with emails to the individuals. Thanks very much for joining. And we'll finish on coding is caring as you whiz back to your EMIS or TPP or other computer systems. Um, thanks again and bye for now. Bye bye.